Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. Uh, what uh, a pleasure to be part of this event and to see uh, beautiful uh, familiar faces in the audience. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's, uh, I think, a common knowledge uh, that the demand for professional skills has grown significantly, mainly in the light of the rapid advancement in technology and automation, along with the emergence of new industries and refined uh, ways of working that require, for sure, a fresh skill set. A set that is different from the one that was dominant for years. Yeah. The entire landscape of jobs has vastly changed, and the world now is calling for, um, to equip uh, younger generations with skills and talent uh, that they need to acquire employment. That is the core of our discussion today. So without further ado, I would like to um, uh, introduce our distinguished speakers for today. Uh, Micaela Mantenga, uh, the TED Fellow and Universidad de San Andres in Argentina. Uh, Marta Arzovesca Tomovesca, you're the Director of Digitalization Office of the Prime Minister of Serbia. Thank Hello. you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Lee Sang Hong, mm -hmm. uh, you're the director of the Employment Policy Department, International Labor Organization. Thank you, Thank you for joining us. And Mr. Eric Parrado, Chief Perfect. Economist, General Manager, Research Department, Inter American Development Bank, and you are also a young global leader. Thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, I'm going to start with the title of the panel, Marta. Uh, you helped uh, put the title of the panel. Abu Gamers. Can you explain to us what does that mean? Absolutely, and thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you here today. And I think Abu Gamers primarily it was a mean to explain to my parents what I do, <laughs> <laughs> because at some point I was I'm a lawyer by training. I'm a copyright lawyer, and at some point I tried to connect my passion for video games with uh, the law. And in Spanish, I'm from Argentina, abogado and abogada means lawyer. So abo, gamer, means like the video game lawyer. So that's the explanation for that. So primarily, it's, uh, it's a way to explain to my parents what I do. Mm -hmm. Eric, you have something to add here. Yes, I, I found it really cool because it's a way to be hidden from AI and not to be replaced because you, you don't have a, a regular occupation. <laughs> so from now on, I'm going to be called eco-developer <laughs> because I'm an economist that cares about development. So now I'm going to have a new occupation, uh, eco-developer, so probably I'm going to be hidden from AI for some time. No, but we probably need to go to the labor uh, organization to, uh, to put a ranking for the wages because I think they've been struggling with all the new jobs that has been created uh, by AI. Marta, let me bring you here. Uh, the first question that probably comes to mind, to what extent have the rapid development uh, of macro trends, including, of course, digitalization, AI, and, of course, the transition to green um, uh, economy uh, and green uh, energy, has widened the gap between where the workforce should be and <coughs> where it is now? Hmm. Um, I would like to refer back to, let's say, almost 30 years ago when I was, I was uh, studying uh, electrical engineering. That time we didn't have uh, computers. Uh, there was no commercial internet. And now from this perspective, uh, majority, most of the jobs, or big portion of the jobs are related to ICT. Uh, on the side of uh, creating the technology, like we have professions, we all know, like programmers, coders, system architects, um, cyber security engineers, um, digital marketers, um, e-commerce. So, so there were jobs that did not exist that, that time. And we kind of survived in a sense that um, if you see the global unemployment rates 30 years ago and today are almost the same. Uh, one um, only one percentage uh, uh, we have bigger un almost one percentage bigger unemployment now than 30 years ago but I guess that is a result of um, some uh, situations in history 
Mm, there are two peaks only in the trend. It was uh, the global uh, economic crisis back in 2008 and the pandemics. Otherwise, it would be almost stable. So if we, if we just uh, think uh, on the trends and the history, we would say that we are safe. But the thing is that um, AI, especially um, general purpose AI, um, which somebody say, I mean, uh, I was listening to a professor today who said that um, it is here already. Mm -hmm. um, guess future uh, is here, definitely, but it's not well distributed. Uh, will lead to machine intelligence surpassing mm -hmm. our human intelligence, and that might lead to replacing us. So uh, we have to think about what do we want to achieve because we are the ones that are creating the technology. Now, we, want to, we, we need to think what we want to achieve because we are, uh, and I'm, as I said, engineer and 30 years working in, in, in technology uh, domain. We are, like we were before, overly excited about the general purpose AI. <laughs> Um, maybe we are very curious what can we achieve with that, to which, which limits we can, we can go. Maybe we are also driven by profit. I mean, not we, but companies are driven by profit. And maybe we would, um, we would see some outcome that we won't like. Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, not to mention what are the, dan the dangers of, 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 of this, because at the end, I was thinking at some point, I will be very short, uh, that this human evolution, uh, and the Darwin saw only the first part of it, but didn't see the second part of it, which is either we are evolving to, I don't know, cybergs, or maybe to Wallis, so uh, Wally, the movie. So we are not working at all. And then, if the machines are doing the job and we are not working, then we won't have problem with the labor market mm -hmm. because it will be, uh, I don't know, maybe we will think about exti extinction of, of humankind or Isn't something similar. Isn't this an extreme scenario in this case? Um, let me bring in uh, <laughs> Sang Hon. Sang Hon, um, the idea of artificial intelligence taking over isn't it a, a bit of a very extreme scenario that will probably not happen? Oh, yeah, that's the difficult question. Uh, just before getting to that, I mean, just I want to characterize how difficult the current situation is when it comes to skills gap. Probably that may, yes. in a way of the responding to your question. The new skills that the, yeah. the younger generations need. Right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, three aspects. The, the jobs gap it's increasingly complicated. I mean, the five or six years ago, we talked about just the digital technology and blockchain issues. Today, we are talking about the GPT chat. So every year, we are talking about different technologies. So, so the, this actually requires a new set of skills on top of the unfilled the skills gap we have been talking about. That's a more global picture. Second, for individuals, it's really challenging. I don't know what to learn now. I mean, in, okay, I'm doing something on the artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. but in three or four years later, when you are actually put yourself in the labor market, the, the whole landscape for the technology so, may be different. So now you don't have a full understanding of the core mm -hmm. and important skills that the new generation should acquire? Yeah. Really? No, really, actually. So, <laughs> for example, now, because there are a big push for the new technology, artificial intelligence, etc. But at the same time, you are also equally told you have to learn the basic skills as well. Okay. Numeric skills and literacy skills and etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the individual workers, if you put yourself in the individual workers, it's almost mission impossible. You have to learn all kinds of skills, and on top of that, you have to learn some of the new artificial. So this is a bit of a big issue for individuals. Mm -hmm. Globally speaking, that's another challenge is that, as you said, where the workforce is and where the skills are needed. Mm -hmm. Right now, the typically we have been addressing that issue is through the global migration. 
So we are moving some skilled workers from one places to where actually they are needed. But simply because of the difficult geopolitical situation right now, difficult domestic policies at the moment, the global flow of the talents or skills is increasingly difficult right now. So if we put all this together, you can imagine how complex actually the overall landscape of the uh, skills gap is. And artificial intelligence is the, uh, coming on top of this. Yeah. In our, um, basically, I asked the uh, artificial intelligence, I just asked the, I posed that question in the GPT chat. So I, you know, the, uh, the artificial intelligence will create a job. The answer is, uh, they don't know. Oh. Uh, so probably they're trying to be more, uh, uh, probably more modest in their answer, simply they don't, but, but they are they are also indicating all good side on the uh, positive and negative side all together, but it's basically up to us. That's the, what actually uh, GPT so it's um, evolving so fast that mm -hmm. you really can't have uh, a set of, uh, of skills that you would probably publish and say um, to, to the youth, this is what you need to learn. Sure. It's that complicated. It's very difficult. I don't know. But if you, some, some young people are coming to me, so I'm going to have a good job in uh, five years of time, so what kind of skills do I need? I say, probably I don't know. Oh, oh. I don't know. It, it's, I mean, this, I'm a bit exaggerating, but that is kind of the speed of the technological changes and changes in skills requirement. Thank you. Yeah. Michaela, let me turn to you. Yeah. Uh, We've been discussing AI, and if you look at AI alone, uh, while it's anticipated to impact over 25% uh, of the existing jobs uh, globally, of course, it's also um, uh, projected that AI will be able to create jobs. We're talking about 90 million new jobs by 2025. 20, Do you view this as a transitional period uh, um, in the global jobs landscape? or it's a change that is here to stay? I, first, I want to take a step back to something that Marta was saying, because I find it interesting that some of the debates around AI today are focused on existential risks yeah. and long-term risks. And maybe we need to take a step back to, to take and talk about the actual and current risk about bias, misinformation, uh, mm -hmm. data extraction, and I remember back in the day, the Obama administration had a report, and they also were considering like the long-term risk of AI. But we need to focus on the, the, the now, the things about the shops that are being replaced. Uh, we were talking about ghost work, because it's not just about AI taking your shop, but also when you are doing the job to train the AI as a replacement for your job. And that is interesting because there, are, there is a lot of automation that kind of like makes invisible the work that is being done. Mm. For example, when you go to a cashier, to a supermarket, and you have a machine that does now, um, you as a consumer have to pay through that machine, that is a replacement of labor because the corporation is not paying to a, an employee to do that job, but at the same time, you're putting your own work to do that. But it's not just that invisib invisibilization of labor, but something that Mary L. Gray treated very well in a book that's called Ghost Work. That is also how this kind of like meaning not meaningful task and small tasks that you need to train a system. Because another myth about AI is that AI is kind of like super intelligent or intelligent or infallible. And the thing is like, a lot of the problems we will see with AI today are due to that the systems are not robust enough to deal in terms, for example, for computer vision and facial recognition, and they see in terms of statistics. So when a computer say that this person is that person, for example, in a security camera, that's a probability. And in the middle, there is a lot of invisible labor of, for example, people categorizing images to train AI generative systems that are being paid like very little to do that. So it's not just thinking about the future in terms of the, all the works that are going to, to disappear. And of course, I wanted to comment of, of you saying like the transformation of work. For me, it's interesting because coming from video games, we have like really interesting examples of new shops that are being created by technology. How many of you would believe like 10 years ago or 15 years ago that being a professional eSport player, a content creator, 
an influencer, a gamer, a streamer could be a shop. So it's interesting to see how we adapt into that technology and also how younger generations are building skills, yeah. maybe not in, in the formal way, going to a university, but going to YouTube, Twitch, mm. or maybe amongst their peers. Mm. They, there are now schools that are teaching people how to stream, how to play a game. So that's an interesting development in terms of in terms of shops. So I'm going to go back again mm. to the um, skills that needed. Mm. I think it's very important also to discuss this. And my question to you: um, Do you have in mind a clear um, um, idea of skills that younger generations um, uh, really need um, um, to use to acquire employment? going forward, and especially uh, related to the global force that actually emerged the last two, three years? I think labor markets are evolving really quickly because of the technological change. Uh, but the skills gap is, is huge. So we mm -hmm. spend a lot of time talking about the stranded assets, and we have to think about the stranded people, because we have to change how we teach kids we have to change education, and we have to do training for our workers, and, and we're not doing that. Mm. So, so you said change of education? Of course. We, in, in several countries around the world, we are living an education crisis. You don't see it because it's long term. You can see other type of crisis, geopolitical crisis. We have here the, the war in Ukraine and now in Israel. Mm. But no, nobody talks about education. What is the crisis in education that you, education, you see and needs to be fixed? The, the skills gap is, is huge and, and governments and, and the private sector are running different races. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the businesses is very short term, 100 meters. The governments is the marathon, but probably we don't have much time for a marathon. And, and we need to run something in the middle at 10K. And, and trying to find grants in terms of providing the right education for these uh, changes. So, and we need to be flexible. So, yeah. for, for instance, Sanjon, he said, probably we don't know what to learn now, but we have to be flexible enough to be exactly. trained all the time, exactly. yeah. constantly, yeah. Mm. not mm. just having an undergrad title or, or, or a master's or a PhD, we need to train constantly. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the, the change that we have to do in every, in every country. Um, and, and, that, and the challenge is huge and we don't have much time. Mm -hmm. I wrote a, a blog recently um, about that, telling all the challenges, but also the opportunities. And we have to, to make that change mm -hmm. fast. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eric. Eric said that we have Okay, come on. Just uh, Eric's great uh, uh, point. I mean, the, I think uh, probably this is something we have to actually remember because World Crime Forum, for example, had been advocating for the investment in skills and people for, for more than 10 years, I believe. The irony is that despite all this strong rhetoric here and also the other places, actual investment mm -hmm. in skills and training has been declining in many countries. Well, good point. So, so that is a really paradox. Whenever you look at the newspapers, TV, all the debate, it looks like we are actually investing trillions of dollars all the time in skills and you, the, uh, the, especially young generation, but that's not what's happening. So that's Eric's point. We, still, we have failed to create a system in which the people who need training in response to new technology, they were not able to access to the training opportunity. That's why there is a strong tendency right now. The responsibility for the training and skills is becoming a bit of individual responsibility rather than matter of the social support. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an important dilemma actually we, we have to work on. Mm -hmm. I would like to add when we were, uh, we were thinking about what skills next generations should have, we, we might think about what are the professions that might exist, I mean survive, or, or the new one emerge. So we train them in that direction. And the idea was that AI would replace these manual tasks, these repeated simple jobs, repetitive tasks. So, but 
Now, what we see uh, with the uh, Gen AI, uh, gen um, generative AI, is that some of the creative tasks, some of the creative jobs are disappearing, really. Because, you know, I've seen an example um, of uh, two people setting a company in 15 minutes, uh, not necessarily meaning uh, that they uh, registered the company, but they really, it took the entrepreneurship part, which many consultants, uh, experts were doing before, so the creative workers. So what they did, they had an idea, they ran through a program which uh, designed their products and services. Then they uh, put another program, it prepared their marketing plan. Then they put another program, designed their website. Then they put another program. So uh, e-commerce distribution was, uh, was done. So there are so many, so many aspects. So we have to, we have to think, uh, what are the jobs, if we can say, that will stay, and what are the jobs that will be replaced uh, in the near future? Because in the far future, we don't know whether all the jobs will be replaced or not. So in the near future, you, you can think about uh, what jobs we would like to stay, because it's up to us in a sense that we want to keep these jobs that relate to some interpersonal skills that we have. Mm -hmm. We have to keep, mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, you know, our therapists and our babysitters. We might think about, I don't know, um, in production robot lines and I mean robotic lines. We might think about distribution. We might think about cashiers that we can go to a, a cashier and without uh, having a person there. But still, those are the skills which I think that should, uh, uh, should stay, and we should work on developing them, and that's our interpersonal skills, which is communication, which is, I don't know, problem solving, which is decision making, which is kind of empathy, Empathy mm -hmm. is the most important one. Uh, not to mention the others, but empathy, why is empathy uh, very important? Because we want to teach our kids at, for the beginning uh, uh, values, what are the most important values for humans, and what the systems that we are going to design, even if they become engineers and programmers, the systems that they are going to design are safe by design, mm -hmm. and not uh, we design something, uh, some Frankenstein, let's say again, and then it comes and destroys us. Mm -hmm. So these are the skills that I think that are basic skills. We, we should get to the basics, to the roots. Uh, it will provide a better world for all of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Marta raised a, a very interesting point because automation replaced job with repetitive tasks. AI can replace cognitive jobs that require, that require uh, cognitive actions. And this is very important because it's interesting because to, to prepare for this panel, we get all the data from occupation from the OCD, all the survey to employers, and we try to come up with a measure of resilience uh, against uh, AI. Mm. And we found out that developing countries are much more resilient to AI mm -hmm. than OECD Absolutely. countries. Mm -hmm. Because OECD are more advanced, they are much closer in terms of digitalization. So this is very interesting in terms of that the skills gap is not only on regular jobs, but also on these uh, more, more advanced jobs. So that, that's an open mm. question. That we just, just to add something here. So uh, even today, 30%, uh, 30 years after the the commercial internet, uh, half of the world population, 3.9 billion, are not connected to internet. Exactly. So we are talking about uh, AI and robots and drones and 5Gs, but they don't, they, it, it's impossible. So then in that sense, the labor uh, market uh, will change differently in the global south and global north. Okay. And that's, mm -hmm. Interesting. And I think, I want to, yes, please. Just Michaela. a quick interjection, but for me, also about the skill sets, it's about, no, I, I agree with empathy and I agree with kind of like that kind of skills, like, but also thinking about curiosity, curiosity and critical thinking. 
because that are the things that today might not be replaced. And thinking in terms of shops, the shops that are more at risk are those that have like a large corpus of knowledge behind that, you, that machines can learn. So for me, and this is more like an intuition from my research, but when you have like these weird combinations of shops, like that's kind of like micro different skills and specializations, that are the shops that are going to be harder to replace. Or when you have to combine a cognitive skill with a manual skill, for example, I used to show that hairdresser is going to be one of the most difficult tasks to replace because they have to have like not only the cognitive knowledge on how to do things, but also like interpreting the data of, of each client. So that is going to be like professions of shows, but also but also these particular skill sets and mix of skill sets that might not be apparent to the system because they don't have enough data to have learned from that. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to comment on something you were saying about this polarization and redistribution. Because there is a very interesting book from many years ago that's called Human Needs to Not Apply. And was thinking about when you have that this replacement of shows, for example, like robotaxis or, or uh, uh, non-pilot uh, vehicles, the thing is like you are creating a new fund of wealth and that person is able to buy a second car and put like a second car to work and you are kind of like bridging in the gap. So we're creating this very, very uh, far away uh, society in terms of how do you redistribute wealth. So back many years ago, one of the things that we were talking about when we were starting to talk about the robot revolution is about introducing a robot tax and it's sometimes it's how do we redistribute wealth and how to create new means of wealth to create the society that we want to see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sanghon, I think we cannot do anything unless we work no, together. We have, there is a lot we have to do, actually. <laughs> and uh, my question to you, what is the role uh, of both government and businesses uh, in implementing the reskilling needed to meet the demand of today? Okay. Uh, just in a, I'm saying a lot of bluntery here. Because we're talking about the skills, demand, and etc., as if this is something everybody should do. But if you put yourself in the situation of the ordinary worker, this is really demanding. We are putting lots of things on them mm -hmm. without actually much support from the society and the business and the government and from the public policies. So if for the cognitive skill, it's very easy to say, okay, okay, on top of all of this, you need the cognitive skills. That's great. But the many young people simply don't understand why they need a cognitive skill when actually job opportunities are not very clear for them. So I think it's well, why do you think it's not clear? Because the cognitive skill is good, but it's very generic skills. Then actually you don't see, you don't associate these skills with a specific very practical, concrete mm -hmm. job opportunities. They simply fail to see why these kind of skills are needed as a part of the job search in a difficult labor market situation. So this, also the, it's very important to remember, all of us, the training and skill, skill uh, the acquisition requires time and money, you, investment from individuals. So the, my point is, we will have to make sure these workers, people, individuals, whoever need a sport, uh, who need a training skills, proper support should be provided fully from the, uh, from the society, uh, government, and the business, not once a time. It should be provided over the, the life cycle. We are talking about life and learning all the time, but which means we have to provide all the support whenever they need it at different stages of life. Do we have money for that? Yes, we do, because we see how much money we have during the pandemic. So we put a lot of trillion dollars in actually providing simple income support for those people who are affected. So I mean, if the society is interested in mobilizing resources to support that process, mm -hmm. then but we certainly think, can make it happen. Yeah, yeah, but I think the question here, do we have the political will, actually, to make this money accessible? Uh, and uh, to be used for training and other purposes mm -hmm. in order to equip the younger generation. Michaela. Mm -hmm. Michaela. <laughs> yes. I, I was thinking that made me think about something that I have seen happening in the Web3 space and how also it's not just 
the training of the skill set that has changed, but also the process of engaging from employers and employees. A lot of people have been uh, get sh getting shops in Discord because you create a community, you start a project, people start to get involved in this project, you learn on the shop the mm. skills that you need, and that's why I was thinking about curiosity because mm. it's that motivation to learning what you are doing in this space and co-creating the space that has uh, lent people uh, the place to get a, a new show. So for me, it's interesting also how people are going to adapt to these new relationships and how, how do you certify your skills? Mm. Because sometimes these new spaces that don't have like the same type of certifications that university regularly do. Um, and so it's, it's interesting also, it's not only changing in terms of skills, but in also in the processes of how you engage to, to contract people for the shop. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. We know more or less what to do. Mm -hmm. So this reminds me of a story of San Agustin. Before being a saint, he enjoyed life. He lived a very hedonistic life, and he committed all type of sins. But one day, he wanted to convert, and he knelt and prayed to God, give me chastity and continence, but not yet. <laughs> and this is the problem of our policies. We know what to do, but we're not doing it. Why? And let me give you an example. For instance, <laughs> again, with the education example, our careers are really long in several countries. And they know that they have to change, they have to shorten them, and we, they are not doing that. So I think the government has to be more flexible in terms of adapting to, to labor markets. And the retirement age, you mean? Exactly. And the business sector, of course, have to provide upskilling, reskilling, and try to provide some information to change the, the type of if, education that we're getting. Mm -hmm. If I may add to this, because I'm representing government. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, there are many things that government can do, definitely. I mean, so many things. And I'm thinking what we have done, for example, in Serbia to prepare prepare even young, young generations, but also reskilling uh, the workers already existing on the market. So um, when it starts for, for, for children, we have run for many years this program of training the kids to code, but now they are learning artificial intelligence, um, the application of uh, artificial intelligence and algorithmic thinking from the first grade in, in their elementary schools. So we have already several generations of uh, kids that already uh, know how to deal with this digital world. We have, which is very interesting for what, what we've done as a government uh, for the government employees and for the business sector. We prepared a training on the, it's called the introduction to the fourth industrial revolution, but it has eight of the uh, latest trends uh, having the artificial intelligence, um, um, I don't know, virtual reality, blockchain, platform economy, uh, cloud, and so on and so on. So we really uh, prepared a curricula, which is very interesting for them, so everybody can go through it. It's very basic explanation of the technology, but it's more focused on the application. Why do we need this for government employees? Because not only that they can use these technologies or have ideas that certain government agency can use them, but because they are regulating the space. So they know how to regulate the new technology, autonomous driving, uh, Ubers, platform economy, everything that is coming. Uh, this is also to business sector that they have advanced uh, trainings. The government incentivizes everything. The last thing that we started is very interesting at it's a training uh, for the blind people to use uh, generative AI. So they can make a pictures on a prompt, for example, and then sell these pictures and earn some money. We've printed, uh, we are going to print their pictures on 3D printers so people can buy them. And then this is how they, they can earn money. So there are many innovative ways how, how governments can support. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad that the government uh, I work for is very innovative in that sense and really uh, helps uh, everyone. So the kids, the school children, and the elders, of course, doing these digital caravans for digital literacy for seniors, because this is the way that they, ha they have to understand the technology first. 
Um, and uh, I think that it's a good an example that other governments should mm -hmm. really consider. Um, on that positive mm -hmm. note, I'm yeah. going to wrap up because um, okay. we ran out of time. Thank you for joining us and thank you also for our audience here. Thank <laughs> you.